Today's show is brought to you by KetConnection.com. Join the free Brewers Club Rewards program at KetConnection.com and start earning and spending points with every purchase. You'll also earn status perks, which allows you to receive bonus points and free gifts from KetConnection.com. Go to KetConnection.com right now, use the promo code HHH, and you'll receive 5% off your order. That's KetConnection.com, promo code HHH. Entertaining, Entertaining shows. shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Hey, welcome to the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, visit homebrewhappyhour.com and click on the Submit a Question link at the top of the page, or now you can call or text them in by using 325-305-6107. I am your host, Joshua Studing, and today I'm joined by the Director of Operations at cmbecker.com, Mr. James Carlson, as well as the uh, President and Chief Keg Washer at kegconnection.com, Mr. Todd Burns. Gentlemen, thank you so Hello. much for... Hey. It is a pleasure to have you on here. The camera, I'm starting to realize, it uh, for the video, for the people watching our lovely faces on video, as long as that music's playing, the, the program we use, which is Google Hangouts On Air, thinks that I'm talking. So when y'all say hi, I realize in other episodes, it's still just showing me staring at the camera like, like, yeah. Really goofy, like I'm gonna get that fixed. Either, either I'll add the music in in post production since we don't do this live, or I'll just or it. maybe don't throw, don't play the music so long. Uh, or, or, or I just cut it off like that abruptly. Play it, play it, play it, and then just there cut you it go. Off. There we yeah, go. I really, I enjoy the music every time though. I, know. I, I get to, I do, do my dancing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting yeah. on Josh's ball today, so I can really <laughs> dance. Uh, like a lot. Context is important here, friends. <laughs> we have, uh, I'm also on a bouncy ball here. So a few months ago, my doctor, who Todd so lovingly refers to as my quack. No, the quack, but yeah. Uh, yeah, the quack. He, for my posture, I have bad posture. I have neck issues from jujitsu. Some people have noticed before that I'm doing, uh, sometimes I'm very movement with my head. It's because my neck hurts, friends. Uh, I move my head a lot for a multitude of reasons. One of them, though, being that my neck hurts. But uh, my posture apparently is bad. So he was like, you know, try an exercise ball because you sit at a desk all day. Maybe that'll help. Uh, like your lower back and your neck. And so I have one in here at my home office, and then I got one for my office there, and which is a great segue to show that, Todd, if you just give a little hello, that you're in your a new yes. office space. Yeah, I'm in your office. So how old are you now? Like 30, 33? 33, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I see this. I was checking because I couldn't remember. This finger right here doesn't hurt. That's the only thing on my body at 51 that doesn't hurt <laughs> on a continuous basis. So get get used to it, my friend. Get used to it. And I didn't realize, too, James, you have back problems. Like excruciating back problems, you were telling I me. I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I years of lifting grill guards that probably I shouldn't have. Uh, probably I shouldn't have famous yeah. last words for anybody Definitely. who's of a certain age <laughs> that I sh probably shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was asking my doc because, you know, I'm not planning on giving up jujitsu anytime soon. And when I first kind of hurt my neck, I was like, so what's the deal, doc? How does it get better? What do I do? And he said, uh, you need to de-age like 10 years. You need to get younger. <laughs> So I didn't oh, yeah. The worst is my elbow right now. Oh, everything hurts. So I'm surprised James doesn't have more. Like, I'm surprised <laughs> the guy can hear because he never wears any safety equipment when we do anything. <laughs> don't, no, he don't. never wears earplugs. He never wears eye he, He's like, yeah, he's just like, no, nah, I don't need that. Yeah, I'll power through it. And I, I know one time I had uh, my eye was itching. So I finally went to the, the eye doctor and he had to dig four pieces of rusty metal out of my eye. What? He just kept finding layers of, and oh, he says, this, this one right here has got to be 10 years old. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. I can't, yeah, top, I can't, I can't top that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. James, is it a stubbornness or are you that tough or both? I just don't like going to the doctor. 
Yeah. Bottom line. Or, or wearing safety equipment. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. You know what? If you never go to the doctor, then they can't ever diagnose you with anything. So you're. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I say about the dentist. And I try to hide my teeth on this podcast. But anyway, joking aside, we have some small talk to start off with. Uh, one, people who follow us on our Instagram at Instagram.com forward slash homebrew happy hour will see that I was enjoying Two beers, a lot on tap. The last trip I was up there. The first one, a no-brainer. James, your fresh batch of Kolsch that uh, was maybe kegged for a few days, but before I got there. Uh, that was, uh, let's see, two weeks and two days. From the day I brewed it, that was two weeks and two days. That, it, well, let me just tell you, I tried to <laughs> I tried to float that keg. It, it was, yeah, it's, there's a lot of beer missing. I actually lifted it last night. To see what was left in it, and I was like, "Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start hiding my kegs of, of lighter beers because I think you would have been better. You, you had one of the uh, winter warmers, and you had the IPA. I think no, you never had the IPA, did you? I, not this last trip. So yeah, I, Todd gets mad at me because I'm predictable, and I think it's what the millennial girls call basic. I think I'm basic. I find what I like. And I stick with it. And so the trip before, what I found that I like happened to be the ESB. I like that. Which a lot. is gone now. Which is gone yeah. now. Yes. Very good beer, by the way. Wow, Amazing it's a good beer. beer. And yeah. so this trip, well, I I discover, well, I say discover, I knew I was gonna really enjoy the uh the the Kolsch. And you know, spoiler, I enjoyed it a bunch. Uh, and Todd, you have, you're, you're exaggerating because I was drinking an eight ounce increments and it, it couldn't have been that empty. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was 24. <laughs> that's not 12 beers. Guys, let, let's not, let's not do math here. I don't want to, no, I don't yeah. want to do math here. That gets uh, awkward because my dad listens, but, <laughs> uh, but yes, Todd, to, to talk about the other beer that I was going to say, I enjoyed, I, while I only had one. Uh, it was incredible how your winter warmer turned out. I just letting it, was it the fact that you let it sit a little is that what balanced it yeah I so I, I brewed it a pretty good while before christmas and then i was planning on serving it for christmas and then i i started really looking at it and i was like wow i'm gonna have to age that a lot longer <laughs> yeah. and then i did you know the dry january so i aged it through the entire january and then i finally kegged it at the last the last day or the second to last day of january and it's and then let it day, and it, boy, it really, really uh, turned out well. It it is a beer that needs to age. Right? Oh man, so Todd, Todd, that was funny. You cut out there, and your face was frozen. <laughs> uh, that's gonna be our little clip I put on our Instagram for this week. That was did one. I look good? Oh did yeah, I look good? As, yeah. good. as good as you do. Uh, hey, so, uh, but I was gonna say that uh, you know we we talked about doing some more. Uh, we're gonna start working about true to style. I think you're gonna bring that up, but uh, uh, that beer. May be a true to style, and then of course the ESB is. But one of the things that, that we talked about, I think we should ask listeners is is maybe doing a series around Christmas. I think that was a that was a neat idea. I think yeah. so, I think so too. And yeah, James, I'll let you you talk more on it because you you are the man ultimately behind the vast <laughs> vast majority of these recipes. But the true to styles, yes, that was a good segue, Todd. We they are coming back to catconnection dot com. Uh, I say coming back. New ones are being added to CatConnection.com soon, starting next month. Uh, do, can I, do you care if I spoil it? You, no, no, no. Go right ahead. Okay, next month we are starting. Oh, goodness. It's not the Vice Beer. What is next month? James, what, what are it's you? It's the, uh, we have the Vienna Dark Lager. Yep. Which we've then, had before. Yeah. Right. And uh, had real good results with that. I have actually, I've got the recipe for both, the extract and the all grain. And then we also have a Vienna Lager that is ready to go down uh, for a true to style recipe. Both those we did uh, had good reaction from people. So they hit the numbers, right? So we're going to release those two first. Fantastic. And then uh, the, the vice, yeah, the yeah. vice beer, right? Yeah. yeah we're, we're actually uh, working on the first recipe brew tomorrow. So, yeah, that's right. We're going to brew. In fact, we're brewing, I think two different people are brewing it. Well, you and I are going to brew an all grain, and then somebody else is going to do yep. an extract. Yeah, Nancy's going to do the extract. And and uh, we're I will tell you guys one thing is we've tried to make this just as easy as possible to brew. Uh, it's not going to have a real complicated grain bill, and and it is going to be exact. I've done a lot of research on it. It's going to be as close to what we can do for a Bavarian Weiss beer 
uh, that we can get with what we have here. Right. Yeah, that's the that's the key thing. And that's what I liked about this whole true to style series that y'all kind of came up with is that it it like I mean to obviously, you know, the term true to style is pretty straightforward to understand, but y'all yeah. are very much a stickler about yeah making sure is the style and todd actually has write-ups which i don't even know if they get included anymore you did a write-up on the alt and the kolsch i don't know if you right. remember that we uh, should include those yeah yeah i think they're great they're great for they're great reading for anybody that's not familiar with the style and takes a risk in getting the kit we've had real good reaction uh, a lot of i've noticed we talked about this the other day the uh, interest in those true style kits have gone up tremendously they so. have yeah we really a lot of people like those you know and i brought up the christmas one I, what i wanted to say about that josh if you don't mind is <laughs> since you get all the emails <laughs> <laughs> yep. is i would i would really like some some listener feedback on this because i've spent a lot of time researching what is a what is a christmas beer and the answer is it's not a certain style of beer it's there's several different styles on almost all the commercial beers that are called Christmas beers. Uh, it's a lot of different styles. So I'd love to have some people's feedback on what, on what they consider to be Christmas style beers. And just to give you an example is, uh, Noche Buena, uh, Noche Buena, I believe is a beer, a Mexican Christmas beer. And that's a Bach. I mean, I don't normally think of a Bach as a Christmas beer, but I think of that one as a Christmas beer because I, I had it quite a bit when I was younger and we could go across the border and get it in Mexico. So, And then, of course, you've got your what I call the Christmas tree Christmas beers where it has the the uh, pine, um, help me out here, spruce, um, the yeah, spruce the, in it. Yeah, the piney, uh, piney flavor. Uh, spruce berries. Spruce yeah. berries, thank you. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, there's lots of, any winter warmer, I guess you could call a Christmas beer, but I'd love some feedback on that because our plan, and I know it's a long ways till Christmas, but it, it takes a lot of planning is to maybe bring out a series of them around Christmas. So people could try different types of Christmas beers for the holiday season next year. I love it. I think it's a great idea, uh, mainly because I have no expectations or y'all have no expectations for me to do any of the recipe building. So y'all have at it. Like, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, you know what else would be really cool is it get some feedback from from the listeners of the show and what they would like to see us produce as far as true to style goes. Absolutely. Uh, and and, and j just, just so you know, we're not developing and releasing these kits because of my taste. And I want, because I, we, I get, I, I, I say a lot of things about IPAs and all that. That's just my personal opinion. It does not have any influence on what we release. Uh, it's, it's not what you like. It's what everybody likes. Oh, so. totally. oh yeah. And I know if people, uh, I was, I had a memory today, which by the way, most people listening to this are on Friday. You're brewing the beer right now that we're talking about while most people are downloading this and listening, but also happy Valentine's day. I forgot to yes. say that to you guys, Yeah. Uh, but on <laughs> Valentine's day last year, I guess I was up there, uh, at the headquarters. Sorry, honey. I forgot that, uh, or if I didn't apologize to you last year for being at the office instead, but I have a photo in my memories. It was either from today or yesterday and Facebook that was of, uh, your new England IPA that you brewed. Do you remember that one? James? I do. Yeah. I and, do. And that one, uh, was actually, it, it was really good. It was a really good representation. And I thought it was the funniest thing in the world because like, even though it was a style you didn't, I don't even think you took a keg home. Did you? I did. I did. If you remember the, the, the person I was seeing at the time, right. she really liked those. And Oh, hey, uh, hey. Oh, well, hey, he does like IPAs <laughs> if his girlfriend likes IPAs. Did I put see? my foot in my mouth on, on Valentine's Day? <laughs> no, it's all good. That's, uh, you know, that was a good memory. So yeah, uh, no, nothing wrong with that at all. But uh, yeah, you, you I did take a those. keg home. I'm sorry. I do remember. I did. Now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The cool thing about that recipe, it was the first one I did for a, a New England style IPA. And I did not use any any uh, uh, lactose in it. It was all mashing schedule and it, it still turned out pretty creamy considering we didn't put any lactose in it. And it was the prettiest haze I've ever seen on yeah. a New England. Like you made sure the presentation, it was like, I don't want you. I remember you telling me you didn't want it to look like mud water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You wanted it to be like clear haze, if that makes sense. And I thought yeah, you accomplished like, it. 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was fun to do. Man alive, was there a lot of hops in that thing? Because well, if many- you remember, we did like a ten gallon batch. I want to say there was three pounds of hops that I put in it total. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Todd, for covering that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no problem. Well, I'm a great boss. Yeah, well, Todd, he does enjoy your brewing. It's a win-win, really. Yeah. Um, well, I enjoy his brewing. He, I don't think I've ever had anything of his that wasn't, uh, you know, exceptional. Yeah, like the ESB. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. And the winter warmer. And the winter warmer, yeah. A, uh, the more beer that you have on tap at your barn, Todd, the more likely I am to keep coming up to headquarters. So. Uh, and I, I got to tell you though, I've with a winter warmer and those two IPS, the black IPA and the red IPA, a man has to be careful how much beer he consumes because those things are, will knock you down. They are all like right around 8%. So that cost was kind of my saving grace. It, too bad. Josh drank it all, but <laughs> Anyway, hey, guess what, guys? Today is a Q&A show. Let's uh, move on to that. Uh, I did bring two questions to the table, and we'll start with the first one from Frank C., who used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Frank wrote in, hello, gentlemen, and Joshua. I think that was a jab at me. Uh, Love the podcast, and I'm an avid listener. With that said, hopefully you guys can assist me in my issue. I've been brewing for two years and recently jumped into all grain. I purchased two 10-gallon coolers to begin in my endeavor. My first batch was a smash. The brewing process the brewing process went without a hitch and tasted amazing. My second batch wasn't as easy. I did the same thing as the first batch, but ended up getting a stut sparge. How can I avoid having a stut sparge for my next batch? I also used rice holes on both batches. Please help. Thanks, Frank C. from Fullerton, California. And then he added a PS, especially for me. I said, Joshua, I live 10 minutes from Disneyland, and I, too, have a wardrobe of Disney. So, Todd, don't judge the man. <laughs> don't judge the man. <laughs> oh, so no, cool. I, I would I would never judge him. I think uh, I'm surprised if he's using rice holes. Uh, you know, he, we didn't have a lot of information as far as what style of beer it was or if he's using, like, a false bottom. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming he's using a false bottom, if not. Yeah, and I he's chip he cheesing rice holes to try to filter it. That he, he definitely needs a false bottom. It maybe um, it, with the rice holes and a false bottom. I, I I've never actually I haven't brewed a lot with coolers uh, three times, four times, but I've never had a stuck sparge. What, what have you run into that before, James? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, with a stuck sparge, one thing I would tell him is don't double uh, mill your grains. Um, yeah. Unless you're doing a brew in a bag, it really doesn't do anything. But it, it, if, if you're running any kind of wheat or, or any kind of of uh, grain that doesn't have the holes included, uh, like would be a rye or wheat, you definitely want to have rice holes. Make sure that you're using the same amount that you used in the first batch. And also uh, make sure your water to grain ratio is correct. If you run it a little thick, that you're risking a stuck sparge. So I always go 1.5 quart per pound, and uh, that's going to help prevent some of that from happening. So, if just just watch it ha- when you're stirring it, if it if it kind of starts to feel like oatmeal, you might have a little bit. You may not have enough water in it, and that will definitely cause that to happen, especially if you've got any wheat in the recipe. But I would just watch your water to grain ratio, and then uh, how the grains milled. If it's milled too too fine and you don't have full complete husks, uh, it can cause that as well. So let's go back a little bit uh, and to dissect the question. Uh, first off, because you know how I, I like to cover the spectrum and drag a question down rabbit trails uh, or rabbit holes or whatever the saying is. Uh, R- what, rabbit holes, yeah. That, that too. Th- those two. Throw them in there. Uh, what is a rice hole, guys? It's a uh, hole from rice. Oh, yeah, exactly. Wrap it up. That's today's episode. <laughs> okay, smart Alex. That's the thing that it comes is. It's the, the, the hole from just, the rice. So. Okay, just because there are people who that is literally their first time hearing it. Do does catconnection.com, does homebrew supply, does their local is that a common Oh item? yeah, every, everybody's gonna carry it. And it, yeah. I mean think of the husk over a piece of corn, because that's I mean, over a ear of corn, that giant husk. I mean it's that's not a very good analogy, but it's like that. It covers the the grain. It's the shell of the grain. It's the shell of the grain. It's yeah. 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 Right. I'm just I, I I say that for two reasons. One, I, I've known because we we've 
I've seen them in person. But I, when I thought about it just now, we've never used them, even on our, our cooler brew, which would be the more com- – like on your rims or a Herm system, they're not super common. Uh, you wouldn't use them, right, James? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, you yeah, because do- you have oh, recirculation. Oh. Yep. Oh, wait, you um, don't- and if you, if you don't have uh, – Grainfather's a good example – if you don't go, if I've had issues when I'm trying to go one to one on the water ratio, and uh, it won't circulate enough to keep the element covered because the pump will suck it dry. You have to you have to choke off the the uh, the spar jar valve. But on a big system like the spike system, we have a lot bigger surface area for the uh, for the false bottom. But it still is possible those proteins can kind of jelly up at the bottom and uh, create kind of like a uh, like a mud like a plastery on the bottom of the, the mash tun and it won't let any circulation or enough recirculation through the grain bed. So when you're adding rice holes, you're just adding little gaps, minute gaps between yeah. the, the uh, starches inside the mash tun. And, and it doesn't add would, anything to the beer, right? I mean, it does. There's no, no people, it do. people are like, I don't want to use a rice head junk, but there is nothing that's zero vir- virtually nothing that it's adding to it. So but sad. one thing, one thing you got to remember on rice holes, and this is very important Especially when we're talking about water to grain ratio, you if you you I would suggest you get a good brewing calculator and put that in the brewing calculator because it's going to compensate for the absorption that the grain hulls will absorb water wise. So you could be off on your water to grain ratio if you don't factor that in and you use a lot of, of rice hulls. Good point. I'm glad you brought that up because it is something that people who use software, which we all recommend, especially for all grain brewing, or I guess only for all grain brewing. Uh if you don't account for everything that's part of your brew process, you will find yourself not hitting your numbers because mm-hmm. even though you put everything you thought was in the calculator, if you don't account for everything, it will definitely affect your brew day. Um, sure. Him saying that his first one being a smash, which stands for single malt and single hop, does mm-hmm. that also play into why he didn't have a stuck sparge the first time? Are there certain styles <laughs> of beer that are more prone to a stuck sparge than others? It- so anything other, with wheat or, or or rye, anything that doesn't have a hull or the, that's been milled too too fine. That's funny you brought that up, Josh. Because when you read the question, I, I don't have the words in front of me, and I didn't know if he meant it was a smash or it literally meant it was a smash. So, <laughs> like, like uh, was it powers? were the letters capitalized or? Yeah, he means a smash. Uh, like it was. He did. Yeah, okay. 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 I didn't. I didn't know if he meant that or not. So. Yeah, I would. Oh, I mean, he he didn't capitalize the, every letter, but I am imagining in context because, like, when I was well, in I'm grade, from the eighties. Well, when so, I was in know, grade school, yeah. we learned this thing called context clues, and uh, at brewing. I don't think he would talk like Austin Powers uh, this specific time, uh, saying there was, or I don't know if Austin Powers even says smashing. Yeah, he says something like that. <laughs> anyway, I'm digressing, Todd. You dropped me off topic. Uh, let's talk about his Disneyland wardrobe. No, what else in the question? Kidding aside, how come on our, like, it is the brew day, you know, my dad and I, this coming weekend, which is tomorrow, uh, this coming Saturday, I be- we're going to be brewing an IPA that Joe uh, recipe that he made for me to kind of mimic that one IPA we brewed on the mash and boil forever ago, James. Mm-hmm. Is there anything yeah. my pop and I need to worry about? I mean, like you said, the water ratio should have us covered and, and obviously a good stir during the match. Yeah, you're you're fine with what you're using. Uh, you're, you're not going to be using any wheat, I don't think. I don't remember seeing any wheat on that recipe. And you're using the mashing bowl. So, uh, you know, there's no recirculation on that. So just stir it real good. You'll be fine. Yeah, I think you're going to I think it's going to come out really good. It'll be a smash, I promise you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Frank, thank you for submitting the question. Moving on to our last question of the uh, show, Todd M using the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Todd wrote in said, "I am researching different methods to dispense my homebrew. I am new to homebrewing and have been brewing bottling, pardon me. I've been bottling since I started. I have a keg that I keep in a fridge to force carbonate and will use a Blickman beer gun to bottle. Fantastic product, by the way. I would like to either get a kegerator or build a keezer. I have looked at the different kegerator manufacturers and wonder if this fine crew of gentlemen have any preferences from their extensive time in the industry. When it comes to taps and line pressure, is it better to have an individual pressure gauge for each keg? Or is it better to keep all thi- all kegs at a single pressure and regulate the flow using an inline or tap regulator? Your review of the Grainfather helped me make the plunge into all-grain brewing. 
I just finished my first all-grain recipe. I made a Belgian white similar to Ho Garden that is currently bubbling away in a fermenter. Thank you for creating such a fun, entertaining, and informative podcast. I had to get all those nice. <laughs> wow, great. that was that was a That's lot. That's great. Yeah. I know, Todd. Um, and I thought it might have been you, Todd, but you don't write that much, and you don't write no. that friendly about us. Um, you right, you right, are yeah. you are the equipment man. As much as I like to give you crap, you really. Uh, I brought this question because I knew you you agreed to do the show this week. So what are your thoughts on his kegerator keezer idea? I like, I think it's fun to build keezers. So, I mean, I have a kegerator and a keezer at my house right now. Uh, kegerators are great. Uh, they're, they, you know, they're, they're fairly expensive. My, my problem with a kegerator is if I get one, I want like a true or something, you know, which is $2,000 because uh, they just last forever, but keezers are kind of bulletproof. Uh, they, I've never had a keezer go out that uh, I'll have my, mine will go out tonight now that I said that, but, uh, I think they're fun to build. You know, basically what you're doing is you're taking that box, you're taking the lid off and you can see this all over the internet. So I won't go into a long drawn out process, but you, you build a frame, uh, two by six, two by eight is what most people do, uh, frame around it. And then most people put some sort of a facial board, like uh, one by with two inches or four inches longer than what your main board is that goes in front and kind of what that does is lock it in. Uh, and it also makes it look, look, makes it look nice and, and, and trims it out a little bit. And then basically you put that uh, lid back on there. Almost all of the, the, the tops will have a, you know, the hardware that you could just screw right back onto the wood. Now people are, probably some people would probably wonder why do you do that why don't you just use the you know use the unit as it is and mm -hmm. the, the reason is is that there's cooling lines in there that you're likely to hit if you start drilling into the side of it uh two is they're usually not quite tall enough so you need that extra height to be able to for your kegs and three it's really nice to be able to finish that uh, however you want to finish it uh, and uh, drill the holes in it and and insulated and i don't know it, it to me it's always been a fun project to do i've done quite a few of them and you've got lots of room in there to work with you've got room for your they almost most of them have some sort of a step so you've got room for your co2 bottle you've got room for your air manifolds to you know mount those and uh, whereas kegerators tend to be really cramped and uh, also you can get a really as big or as little as one as you want so you can you can dispense a lot of kegs or do a combination where you're dispensing kegs, cold crashing, that sort of thing. So they're very, very versatile as well. So that that would be my answer on the uh, on the keyser part, yeah. or uh, keyser versus kegerator part. Right, and I would add to I think in my opinion and experience, as limited as it may be, uh, if you buy a fridge conversion kit from you know insert your favorite retailer here, so I don't just sound like an advertisement every episode. But if you get a a one that has shanks, the whatever size you need, uh, those are so much more future proof than tower kits are, uh, uh, only because towers are are mountable to a surface where if you build up and up and up, like they're, they're limited in their uh, implementation where, like you said, you could get a, a two faucet fridge conversion kit today and build out a two faucet keyser uh, that you bought that maybe only does fit two kegs or it fits two right. kegs in a fermenter. And then you see on Creds list, this nice chest freezer on sale. That's huge. And then all you have to do now is add lines per additional beer you want to tap. It's unfortunately with the tower, uh, you know, I have a tower kegerator here in my office. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But if I wanted to add a third tap, I literally can't do it. Lacking space in my kegerator and lacking space in the tower. It is not easy adding a faucet to a cylinder tower. Um, well, that, that's an excellent point. And, and as well, you make me think when you say that, you, you know, it's very affordable to buy a chest freezer, but you maybe you want to buy a bigger one for the future as well, but you don't want to spend the money to outfit it with six taps or four taps. You can just do one and then drill another hole when you're ready to do the next one. So yeah, it's very, very versatile. And James, that's how your implementation is too, albeit through a wall, but you, yeah. like, you don't have a tower kegerator at your place, right? No, no. I, the only thing I got left to do on my setup is the, uh, is the glycol chilling for the shanks. Um, I like it. You know, if you have, if, if, People are over and they're enjoying the homebrew. 
after a few pours, it pours great, but you get a lot of foam because it's, it's warm. It needs to be cooled down. That would be the only thing I would say, if you're going to do a remote system, come up with a way to keep the lines like a, like a homemade trunk line with a black hole circulation. It'll, it'll work good. And that's, you know, and you can use air too. If you're, if it's not very far, I don't know how far yours is, but uh, mine's about my, my trunk line's about six feet. So, yeah. So you could use forced air as well. Uh, I don't want to put a box in my wall. So yeah, uh, yeah. I've got the shanks going straight through the drywall. So if if I was going to run air, I'd have to run a shadow box, a stainless steel box and cut the drywall out and mount it that way. So it's just easier for me to do a trunk line than a, than an air box. Yeah. Easier and expensive. Right. Are those well, blocks? no. I mean, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna have a reservoir and a pump and a thermostat in the freezer, so it's it's not gonna be a big deal. Nice. No chiller. Yeah. yeah. When I liked the photos that you ever share, I like your setup. I like uh I like the beer stickers that you have all over. Uh, you, you have. Oh yeah, that's hiding the crack. When I t- I, t- I told you about that, right? I think so. I didn't realize I, that's I where the crack was. Fifty dollar. Uh, I had this big lead mirror that we took out when I demoed the house and I bought a $50 hole saw diamond hole saw to cut holes. And I cut them perfect in this thick mirror and I'm in the mud room tightening the shank nuts up. And I hear this loud snap and I'm going along and then I son it hit me and I'm like, ah, oh, crap. I know what that was. I broke the mirror in half. So when you look at the, the stickers, that's me covering this, the, the the crack of the mirror. Now I remember. I was just, <laughs> how, but you know what? You did a good job because, or yeah. either that, or you have the photography skills of those Instagram models that have figured the geometry <laughs> to take yeah. away the double chin. Because I can't ever <laughs> tell there's a crack there. You did That's wonderful. That's because the stickers are hiding it. Man, James, a man of many talents. Uh, I'll have to have you, like I said, show me how to hide my imperfections in my own personal <laughs> life. Uh, well, I'm your man. I'm your man. I remember a lot of stickers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> hey, so I, 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 I hate to say this, but I can't even remember the second half of the question now. You may have to read it again. No, well, he, he was really just talking about uh, when it comes to taps and line pressure, is it better to have an individual pressure gauge for each keg or keep all kegs at a single pressure and regulate the flow using an inline or a tap regulator? I think he's meaning uh, yeah. flow control faucets. Yeah, that's a very... Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I mean, it sounded to me like he was talking about whether you use a... Um, a different pressure to each keg. Oh, pardon so, me. You're like a bunch right. of secondary uh, regulators. So uh, that's a very personal preference. Some people feel like they need to have every single beer at the proper PSI for that beer. So if you're serving a, you know, an English uh, warmer beer and you're serving it at, you know, say seven or eight PSI, but you want to serve your, uh, you want to serve your other ales or even lagers at ten to twelve PSI, and then you've got a Belgium a beer that you want to serve at 16 or you're, you're serving cures light, um, <laughs> you know, that, that you want to have different pressure for each one. Um, I guess I, sh- maybe I should do that, but I don't, I tend to just kind of do everything at around 10. And, um, it, I mean, it's, it is nice. And, and if you're very, if you're very precise, maybe an engineer, uh, you'll probably be happier doing it that way with, uh, with multiple pressures. James, do you, I, I never asked you cause you, how many taps do you, do you have right now? Three or four? I've, I've got three. And do you have one pressure maintaining them all or do you have secondaries? I, I just, I, yeah, I do. I just run them all at, uh, I think I've got mine at 14 PSI. You know, we only do, we do that as well at my, at both my house and my pop's house. I'm wondering it, in y'all's opinion, is there a direct benefit, uh, to having secondaries per each line besides being true to well, what you, yeah that is the benefit yeah, yeah. that that yeah, so that can, is the benefit you can keep each okay. beer at its own uh carbonation level so if you were wanting to serve a wheat beer normally is three volumes so if you wanted to go at between 2.8 and three volumes on your wheat beer you could have it set on this regulator and then you could have an l on this one and then you could have a, even another regulator if you were wanting to force carbonate a set and forget, and then you could you could have it used use for that. I, I'll tell you one of the reasons I'm not overly concerned about it is a lot of beers that you serve, let's say at a lower temperature, you're also supposed to, I mean, sorry, at a lower uh, pressure, uh, you, you're also supposed to serve at a, at a different temperature. So now what are you going to do? You're going to have it sectioned off where you have three different temperatures and three different pressures and 
Yeah. I mean, I, I just think uh, to me, it works fine, but again, uh, to each his own. And, uh, you know, that's wonderful. If, if you want to have different pressures, you're, you're a better man than me. Todd so. Burns, the mind reader. Cause I, I was trying to get you trapped because you kind of made me feel stupid there when I said, what's the <laughs> point of it? And you're like, well, that is the point of it. <laughs> uh, I'll just say, well, then do you keep them all at the individual temperatures they're supposed to be at Mr. Burns, but you don't even see your trap coming. Yeah. Yeah. You did. Oh, uh, I, I, no <laughs> I project, um, I would love to have a setup, a dream setup would be to have those individual chambers for certain styles to to be served at whatever. But what bar can you even think of? What tap room can you think of that does it that meticulously? Is there one did when we toured uh, I'm trying to think the the most intricate tap room I can remember of us touring. And Todd, you and I have gone through a bunch together. Uh the one at New Belgium was pretty stinking impressive. Uh, yeah. I still don't remember them though segregating styles by temperature they had certain lines and restriction per each one and i guarantee you certain psi but i don't think they even separated it by uh I, I temperature think it's more of a regional thing i think if you go to england you're going to get warm beers and their beer styles are served in a, i mean the reason they one of the reasons that somebody's going to really disagree with me on this but wow what is that noise uh, one of the reasons is uh that it, it, it is very regional and I don't think you're going to really emulate, emulate that because in a, if you go to a bar in Britain, they're going to, it's going to be a lower temperature. It's going to be a lower pressure, but probably the reason it's always traditionally been to the lower pressure is because it's at a higher temperature, because if you did it at a real high pressure and a real high temperature, you, you, you virtually couldn't stop the foam. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Totally made sense. Well, other Todd, uh, thank you for submitting the question. And guys, that that wraps it up for this week's episode. Um, I appreciate, as always, you guys taking the time to come do the show with me. It would not be much of a show on my own. And last week, uh, thank you all for uh, un your understanding. I had Joe on. Uh, it's been a while since we've had Joe. And Joe pointed out it's been a while since we've all done an episode. So in our future, we need to do an episode, uh, all of us together, and uh, I will figure out some topic we could talk about that won't have us all at each other's, like talking over each other. We'll figure something out. Having four people is not the worst thing in the world on an episode if, if we uh, uh, can just do the logistics on it. But anyways, Todd, James, thank you again, gentlemen, for, for doing the show. And I'll catch on next time. See ya. Bye. And that will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, visit homebrewhappyhour.com and click on the submit a question link at the top of the page. Or now you can call or text them in by dialing 325-305-6107. Thank you to our show sponsor, catconnection.com, for supporting our podcast and the homebrewing community. Go to catconnection.com, use the promo code HHH, and you'll receive 5% off your order. On behalf of Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thank you for listening.